Hi, it's Dwyer. GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, both free sites, right? Let's talk about George Groves' domination. That's what it was, right? Not hard-fought win, but domination of favorite Chris Eubank, right? Let me also say, too, to the Eubank people who believed before the fight that Chris Eubank deserved to be a favorite in this fight. In the comments here to this video, tell us what you were expecting Eubank to do that he didn't do. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, two of the three judges have George Groves winning the fight by, what, three or four rounds, right? At least something like that. In other words, it's a sizable margin on two of the three judges' scorecards. The last judge has the fight a two-point margin for Groves. The referee had a very bad night in the ring. Very bad. Folks, we're all boxing fans, right? That's why we're on YouTube talking about boxing, isn't it? That's a clear knockdown by George Groves in the second round. Clear. The only thing clearer than that knockdown in the second round is George Groves' knockdown of Chris Eubank in the 10th round. Understand, the judge who has Groves winning by two rounds, if the ref had counted the two knockdowns, Right, And both times, Eubanks lunging in, gets hit, his knee hits the canvas. Folks, that's a textbook knockdown. Right, Then even the judge who only had Groves winning by two rounds in a 12-round fight would have had Groves winning by four rounds. It would be eight to four on the closest judge's scorecard. Now, I don't know what the ref was doing. I don't think anybody disputes that Chris Eubanks' knee hits the canvas both times. I'm not even talking about the time Eubanks slips to the canvas. I'm talking about two times where Eubank is coming in, Groves lands on him, and Eubank hits the canvas. Right? Let's also be clear here. At 168 pounds, right? This is now the top of the food chain. You're dealing with belts. This is a semifinal, right? For the WBSS 168 pound tournament. Think it through. Well, let me just say for a fighter fighting at this level, right? Let's be critical here. Chris Eubank has very bad balance, right? He's over committing on punches. When he throws a haymaker and it misses, he's out of position to even defend himself from whatever comes back. Now, as it is, I believe Eubank gets dropped twice in the fight, right? That's this fight. I believe Eubank gets dropped twice. Understand, George Groves comes awfully close, awfully close to stopping Eubank altogether off right hands that Groves is just unable to land after Eubank leads with left hooks. Right? And leaves himself wide open. In other words, you know, you hear that a fighter is too flat footed. But even that doesn't fully describe how vulnerable Eubank is after he throws a big shot. Let me also say this too. Right? And I know I'm sounding critical here. Eubank isn't even working his way in. Folks, he can't jab his way in. 
right? We're boxing fans. Forget the hype. Forget Eubank being favored before the fight. Let's just think like technicians for a moment, right? Let's just pretend that we're a Mayweather, um, a Marquez, a Bramer, right? Guys who are reading an opponent. Eubank can't jab his way in. Did anyone notice that? So Eubank's way to get inside is to lead with left hooks, right? That's his way to get inside. Now, what I want people to do is to look in my favorites folder. It's about a one minute video of Carl Frotch knocking out George Groves in the rematch. And you're going to see something you didn't see in this fight, right? Think it through. Carl Frotch comes over to George Groves, who's looking good. Even in the round where Groves gets stopped, Groves is looking good. Groves has, quite frankly, faster hands than Carl Frotch. Groves has physical gifts that Frotch didn't have. You're going to notice that Frotch is not that close. Right? Think of the spacing. He's not that close. To George Groves. He's operating from a little bit of distance. So what Carl Frotch does to knock Groves out is he throws a left hand. Right? It's a left hand that Groves catches with his right. Think it through here. So then Frotch throws a straight right hand from distance. Right? It's a straight right hand from distance that hits Groves on the chin and Groves is out cold. Right, Hits the canvas. Folks, he doesn't move for the first few seconds. It's when the ref gets deep in the count that Groves tries to get off the canvas. And he looks off balance doing so. Now here, boxing's about angles. I've seen Eubank throw a straight right hand from distance in other fights. He didn't have the confidence against George Groves to throw the straight right hand. Right? Now that's pivotal in this fight. Absolutely pivotal. I want you to go back, look at the film, count the straight right hands that Eubank is able to throw and land in the fight. Very few. It's so bad that it frees up Groves' left hand. Right? In other words, Groves, unlike, unlike his match against Carl Frotch, right, where he has to worry about Frotch from distance and where Frotch is throwing power shots as the second punch in a combination. Here, he doesn't have to worry about a Chris Eubank right hand from distance. Right? The straight right hand is missing. It could be because Groves, before the shoulder injury, before a 12th round, that quite frankly, he's fighting with one arm. A 12th round that probably would have gotten him stopped by, let's say, a Golovkin, right? Some hitter who understands he's fighting a guy with one hand. Before Groves hurts his left hand, just understand, he didn't have to use it to block any straight right hand by Eubank, right? Eubank in this fight is completely predictable. He's lunging in with left hooks. He doesn't have the straight right hand. Groves is able to throw jabs with his left. He doesn't have to use his left to block anything. Right? He just doesn't. Let me also make a few other points. You know that Groves, when he beats the Gale as a pro, is on his back foot. He's able to stand up in that fight. He's shooting a jab. He's moving. 
Now here, he knows he's fighting a guy who cannot compete with him from distance. Right? Eubank is trying to jump inside, get deep inside the pocket, and then fight like Omar Figueroa fights, if you know who that is. Right? Lean on Groves, throw uppercuts and stuff like that. So what Groves does is he fights in a crouch here. Comes out, fights in a crouch. Right? Makes it impossible for Chris Eubank to jump in and get underneath him early. Right, so Eubank is on the outside. He doesn't have the straight right hand. He doesn't have the punch that Mayweather uses. Mayweather even leads with it in beating Roberto Guerrero. Revisit that fight. The punch Mayweather uses in that fight, the punch Carl Frotch beats Groves with. Eubank doesn't have. So, when Groves fights small, right, crouches, has his feet wide apart, is bent over, he makes it impossible for Eubank to get lower than him. So Eubank's on the outside. He's getting hit with jabs. He's getting outboxed and he can't jump inside. He can't get by George Groves' jab. Right? He doesn't have he doesn't have the jab to jab with George Groves. He's literally reduced to watching Groves waiting for a little break where Groves leans back a little bit then trying to blitzkrieg him. The problem is, when Eubank jumps in, Groves has a strategy for that too, right? You'll notice that Groves, who does get hit with some lead left hands, has figured out how to grab that left hand, right? Groves does some great clinching here. It's a key part of his game, right? He grabs Eubanks' left hand. So Eubanks isn't able to get leverage to throw an uppercut. He knows when Eubanks jumps in, he's not going to throw a straight right hand. Right? He knows that Eubanks is going to throw right hands, but they're going to be right hooks. Not only that, when Eubank jumps in, Groves knows to move to the side. Groves also knows to keep the fight mostly in the middle of the ring. He does get caught up on the ropes a couple of, well, a few times in this fight. But he's mainly in the middle of the ring. And Eubank, who wants to pin you up against the ropes, just doesn't know how to fight from the outside against a seasoned fighter like George Groves in the middle of the ring. Right? Let me say this too. Groves, to maintain a cushion, right? And keep in mind, Eubanks is not Mike Tyson, right? He doesn't have his head on a swivel. Think about great fighters, Julio Cesar Chavez Sr., right? Think about great fighters who knew how to get inside and knew how to rough you up. Right? They had their head on a swivel. You'd be surprised when you go back and you look at Mike Tyson films. How Tyson has his hands like this and he's moving his head, isn't he? Right? Chavez is even more interesting. Chavez often will have his hands down. And you'll notice that Chavez has his head on a swivel. So these guys slip a punch. Then they're inside and they're low. Right? Both guys weren't that tall to begin with. They knew how to get under you. Eubank just isn't that cat quick. And he doesn't have his head on a swivel. He can't move his head all the way to the side. You have head clashes in this fight. Right? Eubank isn't able to kind of like 
move his body this way and then jump inside. That's not his game at this level against a guy who's already fought Frotch twice, James DeGale, and Badu Jack. Right? Let me say this too. You know, Groves at times has Eubank so figured out that when Eubank gets inside, this is even when Groves is tired. This is late in the fight, 10th, 11th, and 12th rounds. Right? Eubank is able to just, excuse me, Groves is able to just duck his head. And Eubank's shots are flying over his head. Right? In other words, Eubank isn't Murat Gassiev. Right? He's not Danny Garcia. Those are guys who come in and they lean their body in a way where you don't know when the guy has a hand like this, whether the punch is going up top or down low, right? You guess wrong and you're hit in the body flush or you're hitting the head flush. Eubank doesn't have that optical illusion. Groves knows the punches are coming up top. So Groves is able to just go like this Bob a few times, right? Kind of like uh, Prevetkin against Marco Huck a few years ago. It's stunning, right? It, it's, it's absolutely stunning. Let me also say too that think back to Frotch for a moment, right? It's a combination Frotch throws, a one, two. Right? Frotch is playing chess. He throws the first punch to get Eubanks' defense out of the way. Right? Tie up. Eubanks, excuse me. Frotch throws the first punch to get Groves' defense out of the way. Tie up Groves' right hand. So Frotch then can come in with a straight right hand. His own straight right. Right here, Eubanks just going for home runs. Right? He's not trying to set up a punch. He's trying to make the first punch be his home run punch. Right, So the paucity of jabs, the predictable lead left hooks, right? the lack of a plan B when Groves fights small and Eubank realizes he can't get underneath Groves leaves Eubank completely, in my opinion at times, unprepared in the fight. Right? It's as if he came into an elite match thinking he could just land a lead left hook that he didn't have to set up to win by KO. It's as if he thought that he could just wait for Groves to tire a little bit then jump in underneath Groves and throw some uppercuts and stop him. Right? It's as if it never dawned on him that George Groves outboxed James DeGale, that George Groves was outboxing Carl Frotch in the middle of the ring for several rounds. Right, so the beginning of the fight's curious. Groves wins the first few rounds almost by default. Right, um, you understand Eubank doesn't have enough of a back foot game to be on his back foot, shooting a jab, and you know didn't have the long punches to handle a back foot game against the George Groves. So it seemed to me in the early rounds, Eubank is just waiting for an opportunity to jump inside. That made him too predictable. That gave George Groves far too much to work with. 
Let me say too, early in the fight, look at the feints. You're going to notice George Groves keeps Eubank off balance by constantly fainting. By contrast, Eubank doesn't faint that much. He doesn't keep George Groves guessing. Right? Since Groves is the one with the better back foot game, the feints mean more when George Groves does them. Right? So, to sum up, you see the flaws in a guy's game when he fights at an elite level. Right? Avni Yildura, who I thought would do better against Eubank, was a front foot heavy guy who was constantly trying to collapse the pocket. Eubank looked masterful against him, right? Masterful. Was able, you know, Eubank wants to get inside. Does it get better for him than a guy who is insisting on fighting inside against him? But here you saw Eubank against a guy who had a back foot game, who actually was willing to box, <laughs> who actually was willing to box while circling the pocket and who fought small while he was boxing to shrink the surface area that Eubank would have to jump in against. And Eubank against this fighter couldn't even jab his way in, work combinations to get inside, or land some meaningful right hands from distance just to get Groves out of his construct, right? So I thought Groves, who got robbed of not one but two knockdowns, dominated the fight, right? It's unanimous as it is. Just imagine how unanimous the margin would have been with two more knockdowns on the docket, right? I'd like to hear the explanation from the powers that be as to why those weren't knockdowns. You jump in, you get hit with a punch, your knee hits the floor. Folks, you don't have to be hurt. By the way, Eubank is hurt on the second knockdown. If a punch contributes to your knee hitting the floor, that's a knockdown. Now, the tragedy of the fight, and it's something to keep an eye on, because we're not just looking at this fight. We're looking at the whole division. The tragedy of the fight is George Gross's shoulder injury. Worse yet, it's his left shoulder. In other words, he's shooting a jab. He's, you know, throwing left hooks. He's doing a lot with that arm. And now it's injured. Shoulder injuries are big news in boxing. Think about it. James DeGale injured his shoulder. He no longer has his title. Keith Thurman was fighting all comers. Wasn't that him against Sean Porter? Wasn't that him against unbeaten Danny Garcia? He was on top of the world. Had a bad shoulder. Now, he doesn't want to fight Errol Spence this year. He needs to work his way back. Now, I know the doctors haven't. It's still the day of the fight, right? Uh, at least in the United States. It's the day of the fight. Um, I know the doctors haven't fully had an opportunity to look at Groves' shoulder. But with a bad shoulder, in my opinion, there is no way that Groves is going to fight the winner of Bramer against Callum Smith. Right? Especially if the guy who wins that Callum Smith-Bramer fight is Bramer, as I suspect. Right? Bramer is going to show up. I know Bramer's had his own elbow issues, but Bramer is going to show up and Bramer is going to be of the mindset that he needs to test George Groves' shoulder. Right? And you won't be able to dissuade Bramer by coming out in a crouch, bending at the waist, short, you know, shortening the surface area, and forcing Bramer to work other angles. Folks, that's what technicians do. 
They have plan B's. They have plan C's. They're making adjustments. They're reading the punches you can throw. Just like George Groves here figured out that Chris Eubank couldn't throw the kind of straight right hand that Carl Frotch used to knock him out. So I think Groves is going to have to take time off. Right? I think boxing is the kind of cutthroat sport <laughs> where an opponent is going to try to exploit any injury you have. Right? If Keith Thurman at welterweight is looking for sympathy, he better not look at Errol Spence. Right? So George Grove, sadly, after one of his best victories, in my opinion, is going to have to take time off. Right? The last round, by the way, it's preposterous, simply preposterous, to see how many times George Groves with one hand, I mean his left hand's practically dangling, so all he has is a right hand, right? Could you imagine if he were fighting, let's say, an Andre Ward? I'm just telling you, he'd be lucky to land that right hand twice over three minutes against Andre Ward if Andre Ward knew that his left was completely shot. Right? Think about it. Could you imagine the damage a Golovkin would inflict if you're there with one hand? <laughs> the other hand's just down. Right? You know, you're, you're, you're trying to lift it, but it's clear you can't lift it. Could you imagine Golovkin coming over and throwing power shots on this side? Not only that, a Golovkin wouldn't be close enough to you to be clinched by you. I know there are Eubank people who are upset with the amount of clinching. Understand, it's Eubank's job to not put himself in a position where he could be clinched. Right? So in the 12th round, when Eubank has by far his best opportunity in the fight, number one, how is Groves able to land that many right hands? Literally a one-handed fighter. Number two, how is Groves able to clinch Eubank? What's Eubank doing so up close? Right? Think about it. Carl Frotch was able to throw a right hand over Groves' left when Groves was completely healthy. Could you imagine Carl Frotch in that last round against Groves if Groves had a bum shoulder and one hand's just hanging there? Chris Eubank might not even have noticed that Groves only had one arm in that 12th round. He was that far in over his head. And incredibly, the casinos made him the favorite in the fight. Right? Sometimes the public mood is wrong. I'm just telling you from a technical standpoint, especially when you consider Eubank's bad balance, right? Several times he's throwing big punches, then he's like this, right? Just understand that sometimes the odds are wrong. You and I profited off of this fight because the public didn't realize that at this level, Chris Eubank is a little bit limited. He's going to have to retool his game. Simply put, in a sentence, his father, Chris Eubanks Sr., had better balance and more ring awareness than his son does at this point in his career. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Let me say this too. Eubank gets inside. Too often in this fight, George Groves is able to tuck Eubank's head under his underarm, right? It was shades of 
Povetkin against Vladimir Klitschko. Right now, if Chris Eubank knows that he's going to try to win this fight from the inside, if his path to victory is getting inside, shouldn't he be a little bit more slick? What I want people to do is to look at Terrence Crawford, very slick fighter. When Crawford gets on the inside, you're going to notice Crawford does things like he has a hand up. He's inside, he has a hand up. Andre Ward gets inside, has a hand up. So you're trying to grab his head, you got to get through a hand. Meanwhile, he's hitting you with the other hand. Bernard Hopkins, right? Chris Eubank today is on his way to getting to that level. He's not there now. So you'll notice George Groves, right? Knowing that Chris Eubank is going to come inside, is able to at times grab Eubank's left hand at other times, tuck Eubanks' head under his underarm. That's not by accident. I'm sure George Groves planned those clinches. And Chris Eubank fell right into that trap. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. Let us know your thoughts on the knockdowns. Were they knockdowns? Let us know your thoughts on how Eubank should have fought the later part of the 11th round and the 12th round. Let me say this too. At this level, you really can't throw very wide punches, especially not when you're all in flat-footed on the punch and you're pretty much defenseless when the punch misses. Now, I mentioned two fighters, two Hall of Famers, great fighters, Tyson and Chavez. Now, those guys had power and those guys could throw wide punches and knock you out. But understand, when those guys were smoking, smoking Joe Fraser, another one, when those guys were smoking, they could hurt you with very short punches. You'd see Julio Cesar Chavez fights where Chavez would get up close on a guy and he'd just lean. Then he'd lean back and the guy'd be, you know, the guy would look like he was shot in the kidney or something, like he had a broken rib. Opponents would literally just fall down, right? You'd have to look at the replay to see the punch which traveled about this far, right? Marvin Hagler. Right, would come up and lean in. And when I see a fighter like Eubank, who several times in this fight is throwing wide shots, in other words, he's he's reaching back for the punch. Right? This is the opposite of Joe Lewis. Right? Eubank is reaching back for the punch. Then he's throwing a wide punch. Right? So when Groves is able to sidestep it, deflect it. Right? Eubank is out of position. Folks, he's going to have to tighten up that part of his game quite a bit if he's going to stay at the world-class level. Right? Again, look at the scoring. George Groves wins this fight by unanimous decision. Only one judge has the fight within two rounds. And that's with the referee ignoring two knockdowns. The fight wasn't that close. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to reading your comments. Thanks for stopping by.